OK, good morning, everyone. Um, who is ready for 30 minutes of pie charts and talking about metrics? <laughs> we are going to talk about metrics. There are no pie charts in this presentation. There used to be. We took them out. All right, so uh, a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Tony Gidwani. I am the director of research at Threat Connect. Um, previously, I have spent 15 years uh, in the Department of Defense as an all source analyst and then working intelligence staff issues. Um, as Rob mentioned, I am also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University down the road. Um, I teach a graduate level course on cybersecurity and the private sector. A little fun fact about me I like to make gelato. It's got a longer shelf life than cookies, um, and it's delicious with cookies. So. Hi, I'm Marika Chauvin. Uh, it's okay if you can't pronounce my name. I couldn't for a while. Um, <laughs> I'm a researcher on Tony's team at ThreatConnect. Before coming to ThreatConnect, I uh, worked as an analyst at Chevron and uh, helped to build out their threat intelligence capability. Um, I am a total research nerd. Even on my days off, you can find me researching some kind of hacktivist somewhere. It's probably an issue, but it's me. Um, fun fact about me, I live in New Orleans currently, and I consider myself kind of a king cake aficionado. These are our research assistants at Threat Connect. They okay. are actually surprisingly vocal participants in our work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we're gonna to talk about how to get promoted um, and showing the value of threat intelligence using metrics. Um, so we're gonna kind of walk through what the problem is that we're trying to solve here. Um, we're gonna introduce a couple of different classes of metrics that you may find, we hope you find useful. And then we're gonna provide some examples that you can use whether you're a relatively new team or a one-person shop, um, you know, going up to a much more robust, well-established threat intel team. So the big problem we're trying to solve here, how do I show that threat intelligence provides value to my organization? You know, we're all here because we take our jobs very seriously. We're interested in learning and stepping up our game. Um, it's not enough a lot of times just to show up and do good work. If the organization doesn't see that threat intelligence is making a meaningful difference in improving security, the organization's not gonna continue to invest and we get frustrated. And then we move somewhere else where we feel like they get it more. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. So as you can see, we, have, we had a pretty good mix of uh, respondents from managers to senior level, um, or senior vice presidents um, and C-level executives. We asked them a lot of questions. Uh, it was about a 15 minute survey, uh, I think about 53 questions or so. Um, one thing that we were really interested in was finding out what the, their most important success factor was. Uh, we had them rank these from one to seven, one being most important and seven being least important. Something that really stuck out to us as we started to go through the data was that there didn't seem to be like a clear winner for most important success factor. Um, as you can see on the slide, about 36% of the respondents, that's total, um, said that protecting uh, personal client information was most important. 36% isn't really like a compelling number. It's not like a 50 or a 75. So it was like, hmm, do we not really know what's most important? Are we, like, are we not like, really talking across our different um, organizations? Um, this kind of goes back to what Charity was talking about yesterday with actually like, identifying your priorities and actually sitting down and having this conversation with your boss and your boss's boss to make sure that you know what you care about. Because if we as analysts don't know what we're supposed to be caring about, then what are we really doing? And then here, we asked each of the respondents to um, excuse me, to self-rate their maturity level. And this is- Their was, CTI maturity level, not CTI their maturity, maturity level. level. Not like their, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and something that it, like, I thought just personally was that there probably was gonna be a little bit of a disconnect. But whenever I actually sat down and saw the numbers, I was kind of taken aback that 26% um, of analysts said that their uh, programs were mature. So these are the people like in the weeds doing the work. Whereas the C-level executives, there were 55% of them said that their programs were mature. It just, I don't know, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. So this is a challenge for us, right? If we don't agree on what the most important success factor is for our CTI program, and we're not on the same page in terms of how mature our CTI program is, it's really hard to come up with good, compelling metrics in that scenario. So I think this data really sort of underscores what we've heard from a lot of speakers throughout the summit on the importance of priorities and goal setting and that sort of sensing and knowing who you're supporting, that these are things that are really crucial to being able to develop good metrics. Because when we don't have that, 
we tend to live in this space. And a lot of us, you know, when um, we went and talked out to our customer teams or our colleagues here throughout the industry, you know, a lot of times the first sort of snarky response we got about like, how do metrics work for you was something along the lines of this, right? Um, we find them to be a lot of times um, a waste of time, right? That we have a tendency to count things that can be counted, whether or not they're important and that these things are actually disconnected from really being useful values of, useful measures of the work that we're doing. Yeah, they might look pretty on a chart or a graph on a, um, on a presentation, but at the end of the day, they're not really providing a whole lot of value. All right, so metrics. You can't live with them, you can't live without them, right? So we know the good metrics are clear, they are measurable, and that they correlate to business outcomes. And that makes a lot of sense conceptually, but a lot of us really struggle with how to implement that. And when we look at where we mostly find ourselves, we live in this kind of you know, snarky place where our metrics reflect things that we can count. They tend to be measures of output, not impact. Um, and a lot of times they're really tactical. They're too tactical for your boss's boss. So I'd like to introduce this concept of measures of performance and measures of effectiveness. And, uh, like Joe's talk yesterday, talking about INW, this is another concept that we're going to borrow from, um, from government and the military. Um, and these different classes of metrics have different purposes. Um, measures of performance are going to capture task completion and efficiency. They're basically going to answer the question, am I doing things right? Now, measures of effectiveness, these are higher level. They're showing what's accomplished, and are we moving towards those goals that we specified earlier? And they're going to answer, am I doing the right things? So for those of you that are like me, who I don't have any experience in the Department of Defense, this was a relatively new concept for me. Um, but a, an example of a measure of effectiveness might be, or for example, a goal might be that I want to be healthy. The measure of effectiveness might be changes to my BMI. The measure of performance that I can use to get there are how many steps I walked, how many calories I ate, how many king cakes I ingested. Mm. <laughs> it's true. All right, so let's take this into you know, our world now. So measures of performance have a place. Like There are uses for these metrics. They're great for showing um, where you have made efficiencies the results of automation that you've put in place. They're great for capturing process improvement, right? So some of the examples, and I mentioned all these examples were are real live examples that teams are using today, um, around things like total alerts issued or total intel items that were reviewed and parsed for IOCs. Those are things that um, should you should be able to show a clear change after you've tightened up your processes and introduced new automation um, that show that you're getting more efficient at dealing with the volume of data that you have um, and starting to support the processes you're trying to build. Uh, utilization of resources is another good use for a measure of performance. So for our team, we have um, you know, a, a relatively robust external threat hunting program. As part of that, I have commercial sandbox subscriptions that our team pays for. Um, so we have a series of metrics around the utilization of those resources. Am I fully getting you know, the, my money's worth out of this? Am I sending the right types of samples? Am I detonating enough samples and leveraging that intelligence? That's a useful measure of performance as I look at the overall health of that hunting system. These types of measures are also useful for incentivizing a new activity or new step that you want your organization to take. So we had two organizations say to us that they use IOC shared as a metric. And I'll have to admit, when I first heard that, I was very uh, confused by that. I didn't understand the value of why they would track that. Um, and then, and it made a little bit more sense the more we talked, this one team, their CTI team, um, basically functions as an internal ISAC with the other business units in this very, very large company. So for them, being able to report IOC shared by all of the various business units um, is a way of showing that this practice that they're trying to build of more internal collaboration is starting to bear fruit. We had a different team where new leadership wanted um, to cultivate a habit of sharing intelligence externally with ISACs and other trusted partners. And so you know, they created this measure to get the, the, the reps in, to build the muscle memory for making sharing part of their standard behavior. But there are some pretty substantial limitations to measures of performance. And honestly, this is where we find a lot of teams, their metrics are mostly based in this category. Um, at the end of the day, they are less useful for senior leaders. 
Um, I, I think that largely, you know, once you get more than one level above you, these types of metrics stop really mattering. So my boss, when I talk about how I'm trying to tighten up and better use the inputs for our hunting system, it's, it's sort of like a check mark in our, in our conversations. My boss's boss just assumes that that activity is happening. If I'm not doing that, he's gonna come take budget away from me, right? That doesn't actually tell him how my team is moving things forward for the company and making our customers more successful. So there's limitations to these types of metrics and how well they, you know, they land up the chain. Um, the second one, and this is something I think we all have examples of, these types of metrics risk misincentivizing behavior, right? If I set a metric of my analysts have to write 10 reports a month to be successful, my analysts will write 10 reports a month to be successful. That may not actually at all be the behavior I want to incentivize. I'd much rather them have write three really good reports that show new research than 10 mediocre ones. So we all have, I think, uh, an experience with an environment like that where we picked something that was a measure of output, number of reports written, or things I did, and we created incentives for our people to game that system, um, and not in a way that actually made us a better organization. And finally, these metrics are less useful over the long term. Um, they are things that you should grow out of. So the example I gave about sharing IOCs with the community, hopefully a year from now, those organizations will be able to retire that metric, right? It will have served its purpose in terms of building the muscle memory and getting those reps in, and they can start to focus on things that require more detailed um, data collection or are much more focused on measuring impact as opposed to the, the input action. So really where we want to get to are these measures of effectiveness. These types of metrics are much more useful for conveying value to senior leadership. They can be qualitative or quantitative. Um, a lot of us get, you know, collect qualitative feedback on the reports that we write, and that is one of our inputs, and that's great. Um, that absolutely has a place, but I think where a lot of us struggle is when that's the only measure of effectiveness we have. It just feels incomplete. Um, so some of the examples that we have are, you know, incidents discovered from threat intelligence um, or countermeasures that are enacted. So countermeasures enacted can encompass any number of things, whether that's, you know, imposter domains blocked or um, changes to the patching schedule based off of, you know, known exploits of the CVE in the wild that could affect us. Areas where you're able to show that the context that we bring as threat intelligence professionals are affecting the decisions that we make to defend the enterprise. And so those are some examples that you don't, you know, have to be a, a, you know, one of the five largest financial institutions in the world to be able to do things like that. This is something you can do when you're just starting with Threat Intel. And as you get more mature over time, you'll start to move down to some of these, uh, the lower bullets on this slide, things like, you know, improving your organization's mean time to detection, or being able to capture with dollar figures the savings that you're generating because you're able to be more proactive. Um, those are really compelling things when you can get to the point of answering those questions. And I think one of the things that's so important about these measures of effectiveness is that it's the journey you take along the way to get there that helps drive your maturity, right? To be able to answer those questions and to be able to show those changes are gonna force discussions in your team about what type of data do we need to be able to answer that question? What type of processes do I need to have in terms of how I work with the SOC or the IR team to show this type of impact? And of course, that's really the name of the game. That's the meat of what we're trying to get at. So working towards building these types of measures not only shows very well up the chain, but can actually be a really compelling tool to, to drive the change you're trying to create. So there are limitations. Honestly, this is harder. That's the big one. Um, this is not nearly as easy as measures of performance because they're not as easy to count. And they often require interactions with other teams. Um, but we're not doing Intel for Intel's sake. Right? We're not the self-licking ice cream cone. We exist uh, to make our organizations more secure. And so that means that we do have to talk to the SOC. We have to talk to those IR teams. And so this is a useful way to help sometimes make them talk to us, right? Because your boss and their boss care about these types of metrics. So if you're having a hard time getting them to take you seriously, these can be a useful way to structure and drive that conversation. So the key takeaway from this section, right? Measures of effectiveness are more compelling to your boss's boss. Measures of performance have their place, and it's where a lot of our metrics tend to reside today, but we want to get better and step up our game, and this is how we do that. So if you're just starting out or you're a relatively low, mature or low maturity organization, how can you show value now? 
Like, I need to be able to tell my boss that, like, this is actually having an impact today. I don't, I don't have time to, like, wait five years to develop more. Going back to the, um, the survey that I talked about a minute ago, uh, we asked the respondents, how much money, like, did you save a significant amount of money over the past year, thanks to your threat intelligence program, and how much? This is really difficult to quantify, which we're going to talk about a, a little bit more in a minute. Um, but 77% said that, yes, we're saving a significant amount of money, which is great. Yay! Go us! Now, as you can see on the slide, the least mature organizations say, said that they saved about $2,000. We don't know why that number is so low. It could be because they're low maturity. It could be because they don't have the uh, visibility yet to be able to tell what kind of impact they're having. Um, but you can see that just going up the, the ladder just a little bit, just increasing your maturity from like just started yesterday to I've been doing this for a little bit, they saved $1.7 million, which is it's a good chunk of change. Yeah, that covers your salary. <laughs> I mean, I assume for most of us. <laughs> All right, so um, this question of how to start quantifying revenue saved. Um, again, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. But we see that there's a spread, a pretty big spread, between programs that are just starting and programs that are more well-established. Um, so if I'm a relatively new program, and I might be a one-person shop, um, how do I start to, to, to show that I'm making an impact if I you know, don't have the data in place to be able to say, I saved us $5 million this year? And the big answer we found is this concept that we like to call Schrodinger's breach, right? Um, teams that are just starting with Threat Intel exist in this space where it's like, you know, we've got problems, but we don't have problems because we can't see them. There's a huge visibility gap, right? So programs that are just starting, some of the most compelling metrics that you can generate are around improving visibility, um, you know, enhancing detection, and refining your understanding of the threat, right? So that you can start to make better decisions about what is a priority, what we need, where our gaps are. Um, that tends to be, I'd say, where the rubber meets the road for new teams that are doing well and are gonna continue progressing, they have metrics that where they can show this. I can show new incidents that um, were generated from threat intelligence. I'm working closely with my SOC, and that's how I'm showing my impact. It honestly, it does not tend to be very report-centric, um, which is something that I think for a lot of us kind of you know, bends our brain a little bit since that's such an important part of what we do. But enhancing detection, uh, improving your organization's visibility is really where you want to start. Okay, so how do I tell if I'm improving if everything's just on fire or if I just need to burn it all down? Um, so as you're getting started, like the lower maturity organizations, there are some stuff, some things that you can do now. Um, you can start to identify the IOCs that are observed. I know we've kind of, IOCs get a bad rap, but start to get an idea of what indicators are actually hitting on your network but aren't actually getting back out. That's, that's, a, that's a good quick win. Like, yay, we blocked these things. As you get um, kind of like more up the totem pole, you can start to identify like in incidents discovered from threat intelligence. These might not be things that you're internally, like intelligence that you're internally um, developing, but maybe it's the public, publicly available reports. In a minute, Tony's gonna tell a story about a, um, a customer 75% of their um, incidents in a year came from threat intelligence specifically. These are things that they just, they found the reports on the internet and started checking their networks for these um, indicators and found them. Then you can get into the, like, the end of the um, intelligence life cycle, which kind of has a qualitative feedback loop built in. Start to talk to your customers and get an idea of whether, one, if they're reading your reports, two, which reports they find the most useful and most interesting, because at the end of the day, none of us want to be writing reports for reports' sake. I've done that, and it's not fun. It makes me question my life. And then finally, look at the countermeasures that you're enacting. Are the uh, monitoring and incident response and vulnerability management people going out and actually doing things with the information that you have, that you have provided to them? That's a huge, huge thing. As you get into the more mature category, you can start to look at the false positive ratio that you're seeing kind of over time. And this can tell you also the, um, the health of your 
program as it stands. If you saw a very low number of false positives last month, and then this month you ingested a new feed, and all of a sudden your false positives have like gone through the roof, that means we need to go check out that feed. Like maybe that's not what we need to be doing. But also, it can start to tell you whether your program is getting more mature, because you want, you want to see that false positive ratio going down consistently over time. Kind of going into the more year-to-year um, -year metrics, um, start tracking the time to detection and time to respond. These are things that will require you to go and talk to your monitoring and instant response teams, but it's also a good way to kind of start the conversation and start to integrate Threat Intel into the uh, overall um, security organization. You know, sometimes um, Threat Intel, like uh, whenever I was at Chevron, we sat outside the big room at the time. And so we had to like actually go and like sit in the SOC so that we could have conversations with them. And once we started doing that, we had um, a much better like rapport with those, um, those people. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about on this slide is the new intelligence from cases. This shows you that you are starting to mature to the level that you're able to actually identify things that are hitting you specifically. Um, as researchers, we often get asked, okay, what is targeting me? I can't tell you specifically, unless I've been doing the research on the side, what is impacting your organization unless I work there. This type of intelligence it means that you are actually, you're actually able to deploy like indicators and things of that nature to blocks and whatnot and take action on the information that you're developing in-house. So I think, um, you know, we, we mentioned earlier a good example from one of our customers who's a, a Fortune 200 company. Um, and when this researcher was hired, he was a, a one-person shop um, and started by taking you know, open source reporting and throwing those IOCs against raw log data. So at the time, they had an outsourced SOC, they had some sort of wonky SIM implementation, um, and 75% of the incidents that were open that year were generated from threat intelligence. Um, so that, and, you know, of course in this case, it's not just that this is good on threat intelligence, it's showcasing that the organization had some serious challenges with the way that their security operations were running. Um, and from there, they progress towards, you know, embedding CTI more closely with the SOC and the IR teams. Their metrics changed over time to sort of the quality of the incidents and the false positive ratio that they had in those incidents. Um, and then sort of moving up the chain from an IOC starting point to moving to more behavioral-based detection, right? So again, one of those countermeasures, um, you know, starting to look at how we can develop signatures. Um, you know, maybe if you've got the ability to use Yara internally on your system, um, or building different detection rules around the attack framework, for example, is a great way to sort of move up that chain. We're still working on that primary mechanism of improving visibility and detection within our enterprise, but whereas teams that are just starting tend to, tend to start with IOCs, the more mature you get, the easier it is to progress up away from that. Uh, and now, about three years later, that team has shifted to really starting to focus more on creating their own threat intelligence um, you know, from those cases that they're working. And that, I think, is a really interesting point. That's so for here's a team that, you know, was able to show very clear impact of um, why they were investing in threat intelligence and successfully grew their team and got more resources for more data and more tools along the way. And still for that first three years, almost all of the work they were doing was around effectively consuming and using other threat intelligence in their environment. It's sort of only now that they're to the point where they really feel like they've put out these fires and can now start to go and look at how much more meat can I get off the bone of the data that I have internally in my network uh, that I may not have been able to leverage properly before. So that's, I think, a really, really compelling real world story. That's a lot of realies. Um, you know, from somebody who's actually you know, navigated this, this process um, in a large organization. Quantifying value, so this is literally the money metric, right? If you can show you know, and define revenue saved, that is a great, great metric, and it will land with your boss, it will land with your boss's boss. Um, of course, it is hard. Um, so there are some ideas that we had in terms of you know, calculating mean cost to breach, um, starting to gather um, some figures on downtime, so one of the nice things is, is, is that the IT world tends to actually have a lot of these metrics about the financial impact of things like downtime. So some of this is not necessarily information you have to develop yourself. You just have to know where to find it within your organization. Um, 
There are other ways that you can look at in terms of the budget that you have for those, those really rainy days, right? How much money did I spend on my tier three IR support because of the incidents that I had last year? Um, am I able to get to some of these things and de-escalate them so that I didn't need as much? Those are really, really good ways that you can start to show in a quantifiable dollar-based sense the impact that you're having. And that feedback loop becomes you know, a very powerful incentive for continuing to invest and develop your threat and tell program. Um, we put on here the IBM cost of a data breach calculator. It's a, it's a free tool on their website. Um, I know for me personally, sometimes like the tyranny of the, the blank spreadsheet or the blank whiteboard uh, makes it really hard you know, to, to tangle, disentangle parts of a problem. So um, this is a tool that has a lot of different um, assumptions built in, so different levers you can pull to sort of see what some of those numbers might look like. It's obviously not gonna be perfect for your organization, but it should give you something to start from uh, and have a better conversation around where some of those numbers and factors you know, may apply or uh, may not be useful for, for your team. Okay, so to wrap this all up, you know, one of our key takeaways here, right? All metrics are not created equal. And so what we did was we took all these examples that we've you know, talked about here in this presentation and put them on a quad chart. So I made it all the way to the end of the presentation before I got to a quad chart. Um, so we started from, you know, our vertical axis there are the easiest metrics to generate to the most difficult, and then our horizontal is least valuable to most. Um, so to be honest, I think a lot of our frustration with metrics comes from the fact that the metrics we're using today are largely in that lower left quadrant, and that is a big source of the frustration that we have with this overall. We actually couldn't come up with anything in the upper left quadrant of metrics that were both not particularly valuable and really difficult to collect. I'm sure some of you have horror stories about that, and I'd be happy to hear them. Um, if you have metrics that are in that quadrant, you're actually probably into full-on rage mode, right? Like, this isn't just something that's dumb, it's something that's actively making your life harder and you hate it. Um, so what we wanna do is transition to examples that are on the right side of the slide. Those are your measures of effectiveness. Um, the ones that are in the bottom, white, bottom right quadrant um, are ones that are attainable to you even if you're a relatively new program or you know, a small team. Um, whereas, of course, the ones that you're moving, you know, in that top right quadrant probably take or are going to take more data collection and more coordination with other teams. But when you can get there, that's really, really impactful. And so, you know, a big part of this, too, as I mentioned earlier, it's the journey that your organization takes. So if you are one of the people within your organization that's helping to clarify what our goals are, what our success factors are, how do we objectively measure it and get better over time, you're going to get promoted. That's all we have today. All right, thank you very much.